So thank you for joining our Secure Justice podcast series. Uh, today we're joined by a senior campaign organizer, Jacinta Gonzalez from Mi Gente, Deputy Executive Director Leila Rosavi from Freedom for Immigrants, and Susan Azala Perez. She's a Secure Justice board member, and she's also a socially responsible investor in the private sector. And we're going to be talking today uh, about a lot of the work that uh, these individuals and their respective organizations do in the immigrants' rights field, uh, corporate responsibility. And since a lot of us have worked together on various projects and intend to overlap with each other, just kind of see what strategies are working, where we can improve and uh, celebrate some of the wins that we've, we've had. And so Jacinta, I'd like to start off with you. Um, I mean, you guys are definitely kind of uh, blowing up right now in the best way possible, just doing amazing stuff. But for some individuals that might not know me, Hente, can you just kind of generally describe the mission and the scope that you guys are doing right now um, and, and describe your individual role there? Sure. Um, thanks so much for, for the invitation and, and having me as part of this conversation. Really appreciate it. And, and yeah, just looking forward to, to the dialogue today. Um, you know, Mi Gente is a membership organization. We are a membership network of Latine and Chicane folks from across the U.S. and Puerto Rico um, that are organizing around racial justice, economic justice, uh, climate justice, gender justice. So a lot of our folks are, are involved in a lot of different types of movements. And so we have both support for local campaigns as well as national campaigns that we do. Um, but really where we, we come out of the anti-deportation movement because a lot of us had been fighting against deportations, fighting against policing, fighting against incarceration for a while and realized that we needed an organization that was not only pro-Latinx but was also pro-Black and pro-queer and pro-woman um, and pro-Pachamama, uh, you know, pro-Indigenous, pro, pro a lot of the things that our communities are um, and so that's kind of why we, we came together and, and have this space. Um, you know, some folks know us for our work, for example, on No Tech Price that we'll talk about right now. Some folks know us for our electoral work. Some folks know us because, you know, they're, they're the group that's building the, the local community garden, right? So there's kind of a lot of different elements to, to the ways that we organize and the stuff that we do. Great. And, and just briefly touch on, on what you just mentioned there at the end, uh, Georgia. Um, Obviously, everybody that was paying attention, you know, recognized that our democracy was falling apart and uh, was basically, you know, the control of Senate coming down to Georgia. And, and, and to me, and, and maybe I'm just ignorant, I hadn't seen Mijente do this type of work before. And, and if, I'm, if I'm not correct, please correct me. But if I am correct, kind of tell me why you made that pivot and, and, and just how you implemented a campaign so fast. Yeah, well, so I think there's two stories here. I think the first is Mi Gente has been doing electoral work for, for a while now, um, before the, the campaign work in Georgia. Um, you know, here in, in Arizona, where I am, we were able to do a campaign called Bastar Payo to get Joe, Joe Arpaio out of office after more than 20 years, um, you know, really having a horrible agenda in the state of Arizona pro-incarceration, pro-racial profiling, you know, really caused a lot, a lot of harm. And so, you know, the same people that had been targeted for his raids, the same folks who had been in his attention centers were the folks that, you know, through me and a lot of folks here locally to a huge coalition came together to do Bastar Payo. So there's been a lot of examples of electoral work that we've done, but the work in Georgia came about also because there's been some amazing organizing happening in the Latinx community and the immigrant rights community in Georgia overall. Um, and folks were, you know, ready for, for a change, ready to, to take those organizing skills that we sometimes use in the streets to do protests and do civil disobedience and use that same organizing capacity to, to be able to figure out how do we um, get more folks to participate in the elections. Um, and so, you know, we went in and did also the Hente for Abrams campaign. Um, it was really important for us to be able to go out and, and get out the vote for, for Stacey Abrams and her run for governor. Um, and, you know, this last year, 
We knew that we had a mission to make sure that Donald Trump was a one-time president, um, get him out of the White House, get the get a little bit of space to be able to continue to organize. So we were also, you know, focused on the the for a Trump uh, for a Trump campaign, which was a national get out the vote uh, campaign. Um, you know, getting Latinx folks involved to get Trump out. And so based on that infrastructure and all of that work that had been happening for so long, you know, folks were able to continue to, to do the work for, for the Senate. And we're, we feel really proud about the team and, and all of the folks that work there, um, particularly want to shout out Glar and a lot of the, the community members who have been part of that work for so long. Um, because, you know, they literally contacted every Latinx voter in the state. Um, and it had a huge impact and it was really, really, you know, inspiring to, to watch and, and, and see all of that happen. So yeah, that's just sort of some of the, the, the work that's been happening. Great, yeah, that was, you know, I mean, I was watching from the West Coast obviously, but it was amazing um, just to see the reports just on the ground game and obviously the effectiveness, it worked and um, kind of pulled us back from the brink there. So that was pretty great. I'm re uh, really grateful for all the work you guys did. Uh, Layla, um, kind of same uh, beginning, you know, foundation questions. Uh, tell us about Freedom for Immigrants, uh, what you guys are, are focusing on and, and what your individual role uh, is there. Sure. Uh, well, Freedom for Immigrants is a national nonprofit working to abolish immigration detention. And uh, we do that through several different means, but we have visitation groups that are completely volunteer run um, that have really organized all around the country. And we support that network through a variety of different means like capacity building, providing trainings, legal support. Uh, but really those visitation groups are kind of our eyes and ears on the ground. They go into visitation centers um, they go into detention centers and conduct visitation with immigrants who are confined in detention. One of the goals is really to break the isolation of people inside uh, and to bear witness, <clears throat> excuse me, to bear witness to the experiences of people um, who are suffering um, through the cruel and brutal immigrant detention system. And um, we utilize the stories that we collect, the data that we collect from people inside to really amplify their voices um, and share that and get that out to the media, to policymakers, and to keep pushing for change at a federal level. Um, in addition to that, we also have a community-based program that works with local groups also around the country in different regions um, to model new visions for what a welcoming system would look like for immigrants. So one that does not rely on detention or any punitive model, that means no surveillance, no private prison companies, but fully community-based that invests in services that are supportive like mental health. Um, and so we've been modeling those for a number of years, tracking the results um, and doing a lot really to try to work um, to push for change also at a federal level. There is a lot of talk in Washington DC about alternatives to detention. Um, and that, that work has been really co-opted by the pr private prison industry that's uh, looking for ways to make profit as the nature of detention continues to shift and evolve. So we've really been at the forefront of trying to push back against some of those shifts as well. So you were part of the team uh, that that worked successfully to enact the California Values Act, our so-called you know state sanctuary law, uh, went into effect January 1, 2018. So you know whatever we're three four years you know in. What's your take on the effectiveness? Uh, you're obviously aware of some of the you know the political compromises that led to loopholes and exceptions. Um, and, and just, and, and the reason, you know, I'm asking all of you, you know, some of these questions and, and why we invited, you know, your, you to hear these three different perspectives is, I, I really do want to hear in this conversation, is any one thing working? Like, is law enough? Or is just the public pressure campaigns enough? Or is it really just all about the money? You know, and, and so the three of you kind of share that perspective. Um, and, and that's why I want to kind of drill down on some of these questions. Did this law help uh, undocumented folks in California? Mm -hmm. Such a beautiful question. And we grapple with that all the time at Freedom for Im Immigrants. We're constantly talking about like, what is the most effective way to agitate for change? What, 
what does the law do? What can it not do? Um, and I will say after, you know, a two decade career in uh, policy advocacy, I have to say laws alone are never enough um, because culture matters. I think the last administration really taught us that. Um, what's written on paper doesn't really matter in the face of norms and culture and um, other forces that are at play. That being said, law is extremely important. You need it. It's like part of the equation. Um, so with respect to SB 54, the California Values Act, what's known broadly um, as California's sanctuary law, uh, it was hugely important and effective. It was the most um, it was the strongest anti-enforcement piece of legislation that had been passed to date. Um, and it had a real effect. Numbers did go down. So to say it didn't matter, I think, would be to dismiss it too readily. But at the same time, there were, as you mentioned, a lot of loopholes. There were some big compromises in the language. And um, I think there's a lot of errors with how it's been implemented by local law enforcement agencies. So um, at the time that the legislation was being debated in the state legislature, there were a number of compromises made to carve out a very long list of people with various criminal convictions. So I think the list of penal code sections cited was like over 100 uh, types of convictions long. And this went well beyond serious and violent felonies. It, it really um, impacted a wide variety of people. And what happened is, it created a mechanism through which law enforcement agencies became really deputized to start making determinations of who was in and who was out. And that process becomes very convoluted when you're at a local law enforcement agency level and having them try to make that determination. Um, through some of the FOIA requests that the legal team was working on, we actually discovered that they were in direct communication with ICE. There were emails that documented and showed us that they were speaking directly to ICE and brainstorming ways to continue to facilitate cooperation and transfer of people's e people, even those who had protection under the compromised state law. So one of the things they do to work around it is to just skip or forego that legal analysis altogether to invest the time in training all of their staff and trying to figure out who is protected, who's not. They Some of the agencies just shifted completely. And what they did is instead of inviting ICE into the facility where they would walk up to the person's cell, bring them out, handcuff them, and then exit through the front, they would actually take them through the back loading area so what happens is ICE usually sends a request. Um, they might send in a piece of paper, a form, and they'll say, uh, we're, we wanna pick up this individual, let us know what his release, release date is. The local law enforcement agency will respond and say, um, you know, like we just don't comply anymore because of SB 54. And we're releasing him on this day at this time. <laughs> so they're saying we're not complying and they're giving the relevant in information. And then the person is released through the backloading area. ICE is no longer allowed to enter into the premises and you know, walk up to the cell and handcuff the person. But the person is cuffed, walked down this sort of galleyway, and then their handcuffs are removed and ICE is standing two feet in front of them. And ICE is armed and they handcuff them and remove them. And so they're facilitating a transfer. I believe that that is a clear violation of the law. Um, and the language is pretty clear that facilitating a transfer is forbidden, especially where people fall into the bounds of the law um, and they're not carved out. So, but it's happening, it's happening all the time. And really it would fall to the state's attorney general um, to, to do something, right? It's the state's department of justice's job to enforce the state laws. Um, we just got a new attorney general in California, um, Rob Bonta, who's been known to be really friendly on these issues. So I think it's an area that's ripe for some agitation. Um, but yes, law enforcement agents continue to violate SB 54 and find ways to work around it left and right. And so I will just say, you know, again, over a decade of like working in this battle with ICE and every time we put up some legal procedural hurdle to make it more difficult for ICE to ensnare people in its grip, 
they just come up with some new mechanism, some new form, they create some new procedure and they'll continue to get people. And so that's why I say, I don't think laws are enough. I do think we need to look at money. I do think we need to look at culture. And we also really need to look at voters and engage the public in this conversation. Yeah, it's always a great look when, you know, a, a large number of your sheriffs are just openly saying they're gonna violate, you know, ignore the law. Um, it really does come down to culture. Um, and, and we haven't we haven't really evolved from our Wild West uh, sheriff mentality out here in California. Uh, it's been rather frustrating. Uh, Susan, let, let's switch a little bit um, to this new world that I still don't understand. Uh, when I, when we first met and, and I began, uh, you know, trying to see if you could help uh, secure justice, uh, you described this world to me with the Securities and Exchange Com uh, Commission. Uh, I've heard of socially responsible investing, uh, but I didn't understand these mechanisms and strategies. You know what? You know, I've, I, we've all probably heard of you know shareholder activism, but what does that mean? Uh, and he really started talking to me about this, you know, sort of burden shifting mechanism and, and how to kind of force companies to start to justify their practices. And so can you describe that environment a little bit for us? Um, talk about, you know, some of the shareholder resolutions you've worked on, you know, how you identify targets uh, and, and just kind of what your game plan is on that front. You are far too kind and you are an absolute, absolute um, leader and a great person to work for. So I'm very humbled to be here today as well as with the activists um, and experts here today. So thank you for, for inviting me. Um, I, I have to say actually being in finance, I have to give a quick disclaimer. So please bear with me. I am an investment advisor rep with Impact Investors. It's a registered investment advisor and the opinions that are expressed are subject to change and are not intended as investment advice or to predict any future performance. Um, so with that out of the way, <laughs> I'll say um, I now work, I work for um, Impact Investors. Um, it's a registered investment advisor. Um, and currently, um, under SEC law, shareholders, uh, people who own stocks are, have rights, have rights, um, certain very cir circumscribed rights to uh, bring resolutions um, at share annual share shareholder meetings to be voted on if they can get on the ballot. And they're precatory, which means that they're um, simply advisory. Um, they only become actually binding um, if something that is raised in those in those resolutions is a, a material becomes a material risk, they were warned and asked to look into that material risk by shareholders. They didn't do it. They showed some negligence, and they as the board, the board of directors of the company. Um, and at that point, if the shareholder price drops because of something involved um, in and raised as a risk, then there's there's a potential for shareholder derivative action lawsuits, which is actually. So the only real strength of, of the whole process. And that's actually not something that I deal with because I'm not an attorney and that's shareholders, um, big shareholders can do that like CalPERS and CalSTRS. It takes a lot of money to lawyer up and fight big corporations. So um, that's that's for them. And we really, you know, it's really important for, for, for big pension funds with deep pockets to do that, that kind of work and follow up. Um, but my sense, my sense of it, um, and I'll just say really quick, something that I'm working on, um, have been working on impact investors is their Microsoft resolution filed this year is just filed with co-filer Boston Common um, Asset Management. And it focuses on asking for an independent study, um, focusing on human and civil rights and privacy impacts of its customer use of technology, but um, particularly focusing on the customers um, related to Department of Defense, the Army, and Department of Homeland Security. And um, so that that's something that we, we put forward this year. And then with John Harrington, where I worked previously as a portfolio manager, um, I worked on a couple of shareholder resolutions, one that I kind of worked on pro bono um, was on um, Amazon, um, focusing on AWS user Palantir and their contract with ICE and CBP. 
Um, and other ones related to um, content moderation at Facebook. Um, and there's a, there's behind the scenes besides the resolution, there's there's a lot of pressure um, that I think is actually extremely important. Um, I think it's important on the congressional and legislative advocacy and lobbying side. I think basically what what we do as shareholder advocates can only kind of raise media attention. Um, you know, not 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 that that's all we do. Um, hopefully we've this this shareholder set season has been unprecedented in terms of the votes that um, human rights as well as other um, civil rights, racial justice, and especially environmental resolutions have have um, garnered this year is just unprecedented. So. Um, I'm not saying that and corporate change does follow from those resolutions and that pressure, so it is important. But I think from my perspective, I previously worked in policy um, and I'm an economist and I'm an economist in development and macroeconomics. So I think big picture always. But in terms of structural change, you really have to tee up, you know, your legislative agenda. You have to have a congressional, federal, usually federal legislative agenda. Um, when you think about corporate change, what we're doing in this space is in the absence of appropriate um, regulation, corporate regulation. And so that's always, you have to put it in that context that if we were in a country that was more democratic, right? We would have the opportunity to have uh, laws and policies that represented um, various stakeholders, right? Um, and, and the, the whole goal of shareholder resolutions and advocacy from social responsible investors is to pr promote, you know, stakeholder say in, in corporate activities and production. And so um, that needs to exist within a democracy, you know, it can't exist in a vacuum. We need, we need democratic structures that are accountable to actual stakeholders. Um, that needs to be the arena in which we exist. We, you can't have a beautiful, pristine, wonderful, um, corporate um, private sector um, and have a political system that is you know authoritarian right um, so that's that's kind of my perspective of it and it's not to diminish um, shareholder advocacy it's extremely important and it's been um, a way for coalitions and and groups of nonprofits and advocates um, and you know divestment um, campaign, workers at the you know college and endowment levels um, and cities and state levels to really all work together. Um, but it is it is a death by you know a thousand paper cuts type of type of war and this is this is one little piece of it. Um, so that, that's so what me, I would say. Okay. Let me you know part of this process that I still under, don't understand. So let's say you introduce you you find a shareholder um, so they, you know, have standing to do this, uh, and you say, you know, Palantir's the boogeyman, and we believe that their products are harmful to your bottom line because of X, Y, Z. Who um, adjudicates that? Who, who, who calculates the risk as to whether or not that is harmful to the corporation? Is that internal? Is that the SEC? Do they have to bring in like an independent third party, you know, auditor? The short answer is nobody. Um, the the actual fiduciary duty of the board of the corporation is is responsible for addressing any material risk to the company and financial risk to the company. That's their job. That's what they do, and they actually are liable for that um, as individuals, believe it or not. So it's it's quite compelling once you kind of get down to that level. But um, the shareholder uh, resolution framework is simply to raise these issues. And generally what is what stands in between um, any, any resolution even getting on the ballot is, is the SEC and the decision-making process, uh, which is, um, it can change. It can change by administration. It can change by rulemaking. It can change um, it's, it's not a legal, it's not a legal structure. I'm just, uh, it's hard to kind of explain and I'm not an attorney, so I'm not very good at 
probably making this this um, more clear. <laughs> but what I can tell you is that um, there's decisions on both sides of a of a, a battle for to exclude a, a resolution from inclusion on the ballot. And so, in one decision, you know, you can see that there was. It was omitted, you know, based on micromanagement. And in the next decision, it's exactly, literally, exactly the same resolution filed, even maybe the same year um, at a different company, and it was it was decided to be included. So that's the kind of decision making that exists within the SEC right now. And this is not to disparage or slam them. I'm just saying, as as someone who's um, learning and working within these parameters, it's frustrating. <laughs> it's a frustrating place to find precedent. Usually, I think most attorneys find a very pretty clear precedent. And you can be creative with precedent, but it's, there's a trajectory or there's trends or there's things that's, you know, relatively compelling that decisions go in one direction or the other. And with my sense with these omissions and the SEC, just the decision making to get on the ballot is quite arbitrary. That said, and anyway, that's, that's, neither here nor there. Um, but they, um, once that process, once that process is um, carried out, um, the board will usually, usually what happens, the, <laughs> because of precedent, um, there's so few resolutions that are able to get onto the ballot. Usually they relate, like you said, to material risk of some kind. They cannot be, you know, micromanaging or of ordinary business relations. Usually they're filed on public policy issues of larger significance to larger groups of stakeholders. Um, and um, that's usually they're asking for a study of some kind of, you know, a, addressing risk either to the company or to society or to the environment or all of the above. Um, and those are usually, the asks are usually for an independent third party um, study by you know one of these firms like McKinsey or you know Accenture or something like that, um, and once they receive, uh, they can fully implement. They can get rid of a, a resolution by simply doing that. They pay Deloitte to look into it for them, um, and then presented with that information. But when they receive that information, they will be presented with a series of risks, right? And they can weigh the costs and benefits and make a decision as board members. And at that point, if they decide, like I said, to pursue an activity or production or whatever it might be, um, labor decisions, any number of things that violate rights or do any number of things that raise reputational brand risk or have public policy implications or have legislative risk, any of these things um, that if it affects the company and shareholder price goes down because of it in the future, there is recourse by shareholders um, and individual board members can be held um, legally liable for breaching fiduciary duty. Um, but it's it's a long game. It's an absolutely very long, <laughs> long game. And um, personally, um, I think, you know, at the same time, I'd like to, there's, there's companies that um, have huge, you know, uh, corporate responsibility departments and have quite earnest people working in them um, and experts, environmental experts and, and, and people like this. Um, and we're not talking to them. I mean, we, we can talk to them with our engagements, um, but we're primarily de dealing with corporate attorneys who are trying to fight us um through the, the apparatus of the SEC um and that is something that I don't think corporations should be <laughs> should be fighting us with their corporate attorneys I don't think that's how progress is made um and so I I actually think that um they could be more lenient with it they would spend much less money on corporate attorneys and could could come to the table and engage with us and be earnest about it and and it would actually help them and we're doing them a great service of doing a lot of due diligence and market research and, and sentiment research for them for free and they're fighting us. So um, it's a little silly, but that's how it works. <laughs> so. Okay. So Jacinta, um, we're in our, I guess we're in a seven, seven month now of uh, Biden-Harris. Seeing, you know, some broken campaign promises, 
also seen, you know, arguably a decent number of Trump regulations and rules uh, have been repealed. Of course, we saw the vice president's, you know, worst press conference ever, the do not come, do not come speech. Uh, what, what's your, if you had to give a, you know, an early administration grade, how do you feel so far um, about what you've seen uh, out of President Biden? You know, I think a, a lot of the work that I that I've been doing in this administration has been on under like on issues around immigration. So I just want to be very clear that I'm like speaking on that issue and not a general on everything because I think. But I actually would say that this probably holds. Is that it's really confusing. I feel like it's like a very. Um, windy road where at one point you feel like maybe there's some potential and then you're like oh wait detention numbers are going up oh wait maybe they're going to take a different approach oh wait now they're saying this other thing so i think it's actually been very very um there's been like it almost feels like whiplash like it feels like as soon as you start to understand one way they start to change things in a different way um i'm really really watching what's going to be coming out um, in basically, I think it's like August, September, which will be the more definitive um, guidelines that they're going to be giving ICE agents to how they should behave in the field and, you know, who should be, um, how people can stop their deportations and what types of recourses people will have. Historically, they've always had categorical bars for that, right? Saying that if people are a threat to quote unquote national security or are a threat to public safety, however they wanna define those terms, or if someone's a recent arrival, that that should mean that they should be prioritized for detention, prioritized for deportation. And folks have been really advocating that that's an old, you know, a very antiquated criminalizing way of, of viewing this, that there's actually ways to, to be giving uh, ICE agents instructions that will actually not allow them to retaliate, will actually allow them to evaluate a full um, case and actually get people out of detention and stop deportations, which were the promises of this, this um, president uh, when he was running. And so for us, I would think we're really gonna be watching like how, what, what approach are they gonna go? I think if they continue to um, use the same frameworks of the past, if the tension numbers continue to rise, if the number of ankle shackles continues to go up, if the number of people enrolled in surveillance programs continues to go up, then I think that we're going to continue to have to organize in ways that are that are escalating to hold the administration accountable. Um, but right now, it still feels like a place where there's there is some room to go, and so I think the question still is is up to them in terms of how they're going to be responding to you know, movements really giving them a blueprint for how they could actually move forward in ways that, that could solve a lot of these things, that could actually decrease detention numbers, if not close down most of the detention centers that we have right now. That's actually very possible in this administration. And so I think there's, it, it's, it feels like the right, right moment to be organizing, um, you know, just because there is so much potential, there is possibility, but they're not going easy. And so that just means all of the more reason to continue to push um, and demand what, what was promised, right? And also that knowing that, that this is what's going to be needed to actually have a humane immigration system in this country. And so we actually have to close down detention centers. We have to substantially stop deportations um, and it's doable. So hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll be in a better place by next year, but we're definitely still in that phasey, confusing phase. One thing I want to say about this, too, is with Democrats, I always say you have to um, don't listen to what they say, but watch what they do. <laughs> this is true of all of them. And in particular with this administration, I think part of the confusion arises because in the meetings that we have with administration folks, whether it's White House or on the agency side, people who work for the Department of Homeland Security or for ICE, they seem to say a lot of the right things, <laughs> but as you said, then the numbers go up and campaign promises are broken. Let's not forget that this president ran on a platform of ending all private immigration detention, and we've yet to see any plan about that. His appointed Secretary of Homeland Security has been very vocal about wanting to drastically reduce the detention population, and yet the numbers are going up. And so one, one thing to think about here too is if the apparatus itself isn't dismantled, it exists, right? 
But there's also this push from the administration to include things like ankle monitors, we call them ankle shackles, <laughs> um, and to include these uh, alternative programs like family case management that is also being overseen by ICE. You're increasing and continuing to inflate ICE's budget, authority, power, and methods and means of surveillance. And so where advocates have been promoting alternative ways of approaching immigration, their answer is to take all of those and keep inflating ICE. And when we talk about like, no, no, we, we mean actually like let them go. <laughs> Like we mean let them go and instead maybe there should be some supportive community programming, something like what we see on the um, refugee resettlement side that's assisting people, helping them integrate into the fabric of society here. Maybe that's overseen by the Office of Refugee Resettlement. Maybe it's part of FEMA. The answer from a lot of democratic offices is like, well, but they're in ICE custody. Like how, how can another agency, and we're like, no, we mean, don't that don't put them in custody. <laughs> it's a mental leap that the administration hasn't made yet. And I think coming off of the heels of all of the public support for immigrants, for asylum seekers in the wake of the last administration, I believe this administration had a mandate to come in and dramatically reimagine and change what we do on immigration. And they made a commitment to get rid of private immigration detention and they haven't done that. Um, so I, I agree with um, I agree with you. I'm I'm eager to see what the what the new rules look like that they release in the fall. And I also agree. I think this is a ripe moment for organizing. Um, one thing they're doing really well is they're being more responsive. When we file civil rights complaints, it's very clear the civil society folks, the civil service folks who've actually carried over. There were a lot of unhappy people working there for four years. They seem very happy and eager to be responding. They're talking to us about things like investigations, looking into conditions, looking at reports and allegations of abuse. And that's all like really great and very, very welcome and long overdue. Um, so I think we have more reasonable, sane folks that we can engage in conversation with. So I agree, I think, I think this is the right moment to be organizing. Both your responses remind me of some conversations we had just before the pandemic hit, uh, the sanctuary contracting law that I wrote that prohibits the award of contracts to ineligible vendors. Me, you all uh, collaborated on that. Layla, you testified for us the first year. Uh, but I remember when we, we had to turn it into a two year and we were meeting with a consultant when we were you know, getting ready to reintroduce it. And at that point, uh, you know, Biden was already the president elect. And it's like, oh, we don't need this law. Everything's going to change. And it's like, even if he was hardcore and wanted to abolish ICE, you just, you realize how big the federal government is, how hard it is to turn that ship around and get rid of bureaucracy. It's like, he could start introducing executive orders every day and it's going to still take a long time you know, to dismantle that apparatus that you just got uh, done talking about. Um, it, it, you know, it's a big, it's a, it's a heavy lift. What I will say, can I say one just yeah. little piece? And this is wearing my, I used to work in international disaster relief um, as well. And I, you know, what I would like to see, um, and you hear this from almost everyone in the Biden administration is, is a tone and the tone is defeatist like this is a big issue and we're doing our best on it um and it's a failure of imagination is what it is right it's saying that something is so hard we're going to do all we can but we expect to fail right um and regarding some of that you know it has to do the failure of imagination has to do with literally employing similar people from previous administration from obama administration and that kind of continuity which is sometimes good and is sometimes not good right especially if you're trying to do transformational change within agencies or even establishing new agencies um the old the old guard is not going to be helpful figuring out new solutions to an old problem right um and so i would say is um you know put on first of all commit commit to dealing with this as a as a humanitarian crisis right 
um, that will continue on, you know, and, and I would say create a czar of humanitarian disaster relief, um, which the administration can do. And like, you know, um, like Layla said, divert funding to, you know, FEMA and ORR and fund it and staff it with those people. Um, and work with you know different organizations of the, out of the UN, UNHCR, figure out the standards, human rights standards, and standards, best practices and standards for dealing with large migration, um, and processing and customs, and involve you know involve um, do international consultations and and figure out what are the be best practices and implement them. Um, also, you know, on, on that note regarding campaign promises, I would obviously recommend to Biden for a number of reasons to become, you know, rejoin and become, or not rejoin, but become members finally of the International Criminal Court. Um, and then to, to allow the Justice Department to look into crimes and, and, and um, all these issues that happened, um, have happened throughout time uh, with DHS. Um, and do a proper audit, use GAO, do a number of studies, internal audits, external audits, and then implement policy, right? You have to take a look and root out and have proper accounting for. And um, I think, you know, um, that that's what's required to move forward. To move forward. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think um, we, there's, models for integration of, of migrants, um, Canada, Norway, there's there's different models that exist within the world that we could look toward, but it takes a little bit, first of it takes, it takes an earnest commitment to deal with something that we don't, we have not done before. Um, and then second, it takes a little bit of humility. And third, it takes working in partnership with NGOs, with international organizations, with the UN, with international bodies in a kind of humble and, and creative way, you know, which we can do, we can do all those things. Yeah, I agree with everything you just said, Susan, completely. And, um, you know, Brian, thinking about that, <laughs> that hearing that you and I both testified at a few years back, and I will never forget that two of the Democrats up on the dais who were asking us questions after the testimony, um, one, both of them said publicly, it's on the legislative record, they both said, we end, because there was a lot of opposition, there was a line of uh, chamber types, big tech companies who were all there to oppose and try to kill the bill. And both of the Democrats feeling that pressure said, you know, we understand there's a lot of concern. We're gonna vote yes on this today, get it out of committee with an understanding that maybe all of these great immigrant laws that we're passing won't be needed and we'll have to go back and start repealing all of them when we have a different person in the White House. Two of them said it separately before casting their votes and wanted that on the record. And that always struck me as a profound sign of how much work we really have to do because a lot of these strong laws that were being put in place were reactionary in response to the last administration rather than truly having politicians move to a place of talking, uh, of getting behind and supporting a system like Canada is exactly what Susan's talking about, something that's truly different from what we have today and that's a supportive and non-punitive system. Um, so I just wanted to share that because that's always stuck out in my mind as this really telling. I was I was horrified when we were sitting. I was trying not to <laughs> show a reaction, but I was absolutely distraught hearing that. Yeah, no, I'm glad you brought that up and definitely underscores what we're talking about is the, the culture change that that is needed. Jacinta, uh, I think we met summer 2019 finally face to face and uh, you had organized a conference out here and we're kind of it was uh you guys were going over your playbook for the next year and i you know i saw a lot of uh opportunities to collaborate um i want you to kind of share with us which first off just as a strategist i love that you guys go laser beam focused you know on one target um, I think it's a little bit generational, but like the Bay Area left is like infamous for I'm going to fight everything every day, all the time. And you never win. You never have the resources. You never get a foothold. You, you know, it's just I hate it. And so to see you guys like uh, what, what's your quote? Every movement needs a pinata. 
right? You go find your, your Palantir, you go find your Thomson Reuters and knock them off. And I love that. So, you know, share with us the No Tech for ICE campaign, um, you know, the successes you've had. Please, please share, you know, Palantir and your Palo Alto protests uh, and, and, and now why you're focusing on Thomson Reuters. Sure. Um, so I'll just back up and say a little like I, I always make the joke, but like I can barely figure out Facebook and Google Docs. Like I am absolutely not a technologist. I don't come from the surveillance, uh, you know, a deep understanding of, of surveillance like historically. You know, we kind of came to this campaign because the ways that immigration enforcement were happening on the ground were shifting. You know, we, more and more we would have people who would be part of, would be picked up as part of community raids, be picked up as part of workplace raids, that they would ask us like, how did they get my address? How do they know what car I was driving? How did they know that so-and-so was my cousin? You know, how did they get this info from my country back home? And so we were trying to really understand how this information was getting into the hands of ICE. Um, you know, we had been fighting against uh, collusion between local police and local jails and ICE authorities for a long time. So we kind of understood how they shared information, but it seemed to be that there was different forms of information that, that ICE agents were using when they were going door to door. So we started to do some research um, and worked with a, a corporate research firm in, in Mexico to really do a corporate mapping of who's working and who's doing tech and data work for ICE. Um, and so you know, when we got the information, there's a lot of things that were really shocking, but it was like a laundry list of horrible companies and horrible technologies and scary, scary things. You know, it was kind of a, a, a long list of all of your worst nightmares of like what could be happening. And so we had to figure out a way to also break this down and explain it to people in a way that was understandable, that was relatable, and that was really telling also the bigger story, which was that we were starting to see that a lot of the same military contractors that had been creating technologies for war abroad were now bringing that to a militarized border and bringing that to a DHS that was then also normalizing that for police departments, you know, in your local city, in your county. And so for us, we needed to actually also talk about the broader process and what was happening and what was happening with our data, what was happening with the data economy. You know, it turns out that the same billionaires and trillionaires that are, you know, helping grow wealth disparities global, like worldwide are also really investing heavily in, in militarizing borders, right? And really watching people as they are trying to, to look for safety um, and a place to live at a global scale. And so we wanted to be able to tell that story. And, you know, we come from organizing. You know, for us, it really was, we had to expose what was happening, but then we also had to create spaces for people to organize and fight back. And we knew given the magnitude of the problem, right? This is something that actually is much bigger than just immigration enforcement. This is actually about how we're thinking about policing, how we're thinking about data, how we're thinking about safety. And so we had to create spaces for as many people to be able to plug into the organizing as possible. And so when we launched No Tech for ICE, we wanted to be able to, one, expose these companies, right? And so exposing them, being able to tell a story in the media was really important. Being able to tell the truth about their contracts was also very important. Um, and being able to connect it back to the people who were directly impacted by this, right? When Palantir was, for example, using its, its software to help the Trump administration prosecute sponsors of unaccompanied children, right, for federal prosecution, it was important to call that out because they can go behind closed doors and say, we're going after serious criminals and try to use scare tactics and, you know, really dehumanizing language to try to justify what they're doing. But at the end of the day, it was someone's uncle who was trying to make sure that their kid could come and be, you know, that their nephew could come and be with them um, in the United States. And those were the people that were being prosecuted and that those were the stories that had to be told. So, you know, the, the organizer that told me that, that phrase that you, that, that quote, that every party needs a piñata, I was an, an, an old, uh, uh, an organizer from here in Arizona who's talked about Joe Arpaio, right? And actually saying everybody needs a piñata, everyone needs to understand the story of how these law enforcement agents act this way. 
And so, you know, Palantir was really the equivalent of that within the tech world. A lot of folks kind of, you know, for a long time, they had a reputation of being really cool and mysterious and, you know, trying to be on the edge of things. And once we realized what they were doing, it was important to be able to expose that actually it was people like Peter Thiel using money from the CIA to invest in these companies to then custom make software for ICE. And a lot of people were like, but they're not movable. And we're like, that's not the point. It's not actually about trying to move Palantir to understand this. It's actually to be able to make sure that we all understand what it is that they're doing and how we can actually create power and backlash against these companies to have you know, a different conversation about what their role should be. Um, and from there, be able to figure out how we continue to organize. So through the campaign, we've targeted companies like Amazon, we've com targeted companies like Palantir, Thomson Reuters, Clearview. Um, we actually have Andrew. There's a lot of different companies that we've um, been working on in terms of, of targeting them and figuring out strategies for people to organize. But we've been really organizing across a lot of different sectors. So for us, a lot of the work obviously is doing grassroots organizing with folks, not only in the immigrant rights movement, but also in the anti-policing movement, right? We've seen a lot of opportunities to fight back against surveillance technology when people are demanding to defund the police. It's one of the, the, the easy ways where if people have the information, they can go in and say, you need to cut $3 million of, from the budget and here's the contract, here's the line item, and here's what they're doing with that, right? And so there's been a lot of ways that we've been able to connect um, some of that organizing to both be able to, to challenge budgets and also pass local policies. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of successes happen in, in a lot of different parts of the country, um, from Austin, Texas to New Orleans, Louisiana, right? Being able to work with community groups that are pushing, you know, what's, what's happening locally. Um, we've been able to also organize with students on different campuses that are being recruited by these companies. You know, both students and workers have been a place where there's also been able to be organizing and pushback, um, both internally within the companies, but also when these companies put on their nice suits and try to go to campuses to recruit young students to go work for them. Having students do banner drops and protests and leaflets outside of those events has been really powerful. And, you know, executives from Palantir have never wanted to meet with me. I don't know why but they've always wanted to meet with student leaders who are causing chaos on campus. So it's actually been really effective of getting the company to understand that one, these links exist within our movements, but two, that people are able to exercise that power and, and push back when they're in their backyard. And we've also been organizing with investors. You know, I think we've, we just worked with a union in Canada to do a shareholder resolution um, for the second year in a row. Um, against Thomson Reuters, and we're able to get 70% of independent shareholders. And so this was a pretty big, you know, win for us and a pretty big, you know, for us, we know that this company at the end of the day, they're family owned. They're not really trying to change. This is all about just, you know, being able to, to, to cause interruptions in terms of how they're going. But it's a big deal that all of a sudden, the same way that investing in fossil fuel, the same way investing in arms are considered things that should not be done, folks are starting to understand that working with ICE is at the same level of a human rights violation. And so that actually does make a big difference and creates more space and more room for other types of organizing, right? You know, we've also been exploring litigation, have been doing policy work. We work really closely with a group called Just Futures Law that really believes in movement lawyering and working really closely with groups that are organizing on the ground. You know, how policy actually passes is important. You know, it's not just about getting something signed into law. It is actually about the process of community members being involved, being able to talk to their city council, getting people to understand different ideas and understand this as part of policing. And so it's been important for us to work with attorneys that, that understand that. And I think right now the, 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 the other place where we're trying to organize is, you know, federal advocacy. You know, we just talked about we have an administration that keeps talking about the smart border wall as the answer to things. We are telling them that is not the case, that is an expansion of militarization, that is the expansion of funding um, criminalization as opposed to what communities need, which is investments in, in health and education and other forms of real safety. And so for us, it's been really important to both be pushing against the dangerous rhetoric that this administration has been putting out around technology as, as something different, 
um, but also being able to use the spaces, right, that are um, where folks might not know about how data brokers can get your utility information and give it to ICE. Being able to also educate the new administration on those things and push them to do things that are, they could very simply do, like cancel the Clearview contract. They could do that tomorrow, same as the state of New Jersey did, right? So like, there's a lot of things that they have at their disposal that they could be doing. And so for us, it's also been important to be pushing, um, and, you know, in terms of, of policy spaces as well as out in the streets, um, protesting these contracts. So, you know, the No Tech for Ice campaign, it does actually, like, I, I it, it makes me laugh that you're like, we're razor focused, because usually people are like, why are you doing so many things? <laughs> choose one. I'm like, no, we can't choose one. We actually need them all. Like, there is no way to create a robust enough movement to push back against these tech companies without being able to organize a cross sector, um, across different type of profession, using different modalities to be able to put pressure, not only on these companies to change their ways, but also on the government, um, you know, agencies that are creating policy that allow them to, to be able to abuse um, people's rights and in people's information in this sense. So, you know, that's a little bit of, of yeah, just where we're, what we've been doing, I think, you know, we're, we're starting to get more and more into work around, for example, the, the border and supporting border groups to be able to push back against all of these proposed increases in budgets to do that. And I think as Leila was talking about before, you know, the, the increase of not only having brick and, and mortar, you know, prisons where people are locked up, but also this administration wanting to expand this, the, the electronic shackle and the surveillance program to include another 50,000 people. I mean, that's a huge, huge increase um, that they're proposing to continue to give to these companies. And so these are, are, are other places where we're going to continue to to fight and, and get more involved because, you know, we're very scared of what they're doing with people's biometrics that they're stealing from these types of programs. Well, I'm going to just do a shameless plug for you. People, please go donate to me, Hente. They're doing the good work. Uh, they're proving themselves. Um, uh, I'm just very impressed and grateful for all the work you guys are doing. Layla, did you want to jump in on that response? Just yeah. wanted to make another shameless plug that um, on Monday the 12th, our um, report that's being released on ankle shackles um, is coming out. It's being published in conjunction. We worked with uh, Cardozo Law School's clinic and also IDP, the Immigrant Defense Project. And I think it's a great like base point for policymakers, for advocates. Um, it has some hard numbers and some personal testimonies on exactly how um, this new method has involved, evolved. And I think it's really timely just given what the administration is looking at doing with an expansion. Yep, that's great. And uh, we'll, we'll be happy to link to that when we post this on our blog. Um, I'm definitely looking forward to that report. Let's, we're, we're getting near the end of our time here. So Layla, let's give you this last word. Um, I, you know, when I, when I look at your bio, you know, I throw it against the wall because I hate you. you've done everything in the world at a very high, amazing level. Um, you've got an interesting background. You know, a lot of when we look, you know, I think when most people think of like immigrants rights works right now, we're thinking of, you know, people coming from our Southern border maybe the Muslim ban, but um, it, it's obviously uh, a lot more broad than that. And obviously a lot more people care um, than just, you know, somebody from Guatemala, uh, so to speak. So tell us a little bit, your parents, as I understand, were just basically stuck here in the States when the Iranian revolution broke out. And you ended up in San Diego, which is not the most friendly immigrants uh, uh, for immigrants. Um, but I know a lot of activists that have come out of there. And so I'm just kind of curious, um, you know, how these things shaped you uh, and your outlook on America, on politics, um, and, and just trying to, I, I guess, you know, what kind of motivated you to do what you did? Well, Thank you, I think. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry my bio makes you want to <laughs> throw things, but um, yeah. What about I, Brian? <laughs> <laughs> That's too funny. Um, I guess, you know, growing up in San Diego in the 80s and 90s, it, it was different than it is today. It was a very 
it still tends to skew conservative, but it was much more dramatically conservative and much more decidedly red. Uh, it's a huge military town. Um, when you add up the Naval, Air Force, and military bases, it's the largest military presence in the globe. Um, and uh, I think being a border town, it has its own dynamic. Um, and it's it was really segregated, um, not very diverse and very limited. It was pretty much like you're Mexican or you're white. And I think those of us who are in the other category um, struggled a bit to find our way here. You know, um, I, I was generally perceived as being Mexican. So, you know, people spoke to me in Spanish. I had the experience of white people in certain spaces approaching me like I'm Latina or they would look at me as I'm the hired help. And I also experienced, you know, like I think Mexican kids growing up really accepted me, but also were kind of like, what you think you're not like one of us, like why, you know, there was just a lot of confusion, I think for a young kid to try to sort all of that out. Um, it was during also the Gulf War that I was coming of age. so. There was a lot of just uh, jokes about like camels and deserts and Iran and just stereotypes that didn't match with, you know, what my um, understanding was of Iran as a country and a culture. So yeah, it messes with you a little bit, I think to go to through those types of experiences. Um, and I never growing up thought, I wanna do immigrants rights work. I don't think that, eh, I don't think that conception even existed in my head at the time. Um, but I guess once I, you know, started to enter the workforce, I immediately went into social justice work and to policy advocacy. I was very clear I wanted to do something that, you know, I, I was passionate about and it felt like had a social impact. Um, and I was coming out of college in, you know, 2004, five, six, this was when the immigrants rights movement was really burgeoning to a new level. There were all of the marches that were happening, pushing for, at the time, um, the DREAM Act and comprehensive immigration reform. And working in nonprofit spaces, I was really moved by seeing uh, young activists. I was seeing that young activists were at the border um, doing sit-ins, sitting in and, you know, nonprofit offices and demanding the nonprofits that claim to represent them do a better job being more responsive. And for me, it really made sense that there is an answer, which is movement lawyering, um, really approaching policy and law and advocacy, but with a lens of being responsive to the needs of the movement, the people who are most directly impacted. So, you know, that was kind of my, my entry and foray into the space. My parents' story is always a little bit wild to me because when we think about immigration, you know, like young Chicano activists where I grew up would always say like, we didn't cross the border, the border crossed us. My parents' story is a, a strange variation on that um, because usually we think about immigrants as like they pick up and they make this journey or they're in their home country or a third country and they're going through this bureaucratic process and trying to get to the United States. My parents were here as students and so they had never conceived that this is where they would spend their entire life. Um, it was a place they were spending some time in their youth. And when the revolution happened, they really wanted to go home. They had a lot of friends, they were progressive, they were students, they were activists, they wanted to be in the thick of it um, and be part of the big moment of social change that was happening in their country. Um, they had friends there who were part of it and they kind of wanted to be in the action too. Uh, but their parents called them and were like, stay put. <laughs> it's not safe. Um, things are getting more violent here. You should just stay where you are. It's safest there. So they were among the first in our extended family to immigrate. And eventually more and more members of their family came to join them. So when I was growing up, you know, like we were always looking at pictures of Iran and I was told like, this is, you know, if these are your cousins, this is your family, you're going to go here and see the spot where we all live. This is our home. Um, and then slowly over time, those conversations stopped, you know, and I think the realization set in that we had to make a life here. And I think a lot of people living in exile go through some, some version of that, of sort of a hope that this is a temporary hiatus, right? And I think that's one important thing to remember. People don't 
choose to get up and leave their home, their attachments, their community ties, their family, their loved ones. Um, I think by and large, most people who are especially living in exile, but most immigrants, it's a, it's a, it's a non-choice. It's a choice that's made out of limited options. That's a good way to end this. Um, really want to say thanks again to our three guests, Susan, Leila, Jacinta. You're all doing amazing work. I uh, really appreciate you sharing uh, just what you've been working on with us and giving us your valuable time. And uh, we're going to go ahead and sign off there. Appreciate it.